Hello, and welcome to Detailed Infamy. On this podcast, we examine major infamous events in chronological detail, outlining the origins, people, events themselves, and their aftermath. The promise of this program is to bring these events to life from a strictly accurate and apolitical point of view. Hello, and welcome to part one of a three-part series outlining the attacks that took place on September 11, 2001. I will quickly go through the events that led up to what George W. Bush would end his day by writing in his journal, The Pearl Harbor of the 21st Century. Although this act wasn't perpetrated by an imperial nation-state, it was a brazen surprise attack of great magnitude that pulled the United States into a global conflict that they'd stay in for years to come. I'll be covering the sometimes minute-by-minute account of the day, stopping to interject with stories, accounts, some backgrounds of the people involved. Everyone knows who George W. Bush and Osama bin Laden are, but most people couldn't name a single one of the men that actually carried out the attacks. So after we get through all that, we'll round things out with a less detailed synopsis of the almost two decades that followed, including the conflict still being fought by America's military today. Um, So, so many years removed, it's easy to forget the absolute panic and bedlam of this day. As we'll get to later, the country turned itself into a mindset of a castle under siege almost immediately. Um, It's a lot different than the American attitude we see today. Um, And there were periods of this day where top officials of the United States government had pretty good intelligence that a commercial airliner was going to plow into the building they were occupying. Full military alert was established. Jets were circling the White House with authorization to shoot down civilian airplanes. And an incredible amount of ordinary people acted with calm and resolve in the face of unimaginable calamity. But before we get into it, I want to make one simple statement. The subject seems to bring a lot of conspiracy theorists out of the woodwork. And I want to be crystal clear on this point. This is an account derived from credible mainstream sources. I draw heavily from respected historians, terrorism experts, and the 9-11 Commission report itself. Um, So with that out of the way, let's get this thing going. Um, The bulk of this will be kind of a stop-start timeline format, but it is important to quickly spend some time on the sometimes spy novel twists and turns that culminated in the hijacking of four commercial airliners on the morning of September 11, 2001. This, of course, has to start with Osama bin Laden, one of the most infamous enemies the United States government has ever had. Um, It took the full force of the U.S. intelligence services and military 10 years to find and kill this man following the attacks, though they'd been looking for him for years prior to the attacks as well, albeit with a lot less fervor. And that's just a, that's an important point to remember. You know, they were searching for this guy in a time when the entire Western and most of the Eastern, you know, most of the world was trying to help the United States find this guy. Um, And they couldn't. And it took a really long time and a huge intelligence effort to do so. Um, So let's get into bin Laden, his story, his background, what kind of got him here. So according to himself, uh, bin Laden was born on March 10th, 1957. Uh, The reason I say according to himself, and you'll find this when we talk about one of his cohorts later, is that there seems to be a lot of uh, conflicting information about the background of some of these very famous global terrorists. I think some of that's some misdirection. I think some of it is possibly the record keeping of the places they were born and kind of the instability in a lot of those countries. But uh, so anyway, bin Laden, unlike many Islamic terrorists, he had a very cushy upbringing. He's the son of a rich, well-connected construction magnate. Um, And he ended up inheriting about $25, $30 25 30 million dollars when his father died and his father was heavily connected with the Saudi royal family which is where he grew up uh, he's well educated at a secular school studying economics and business and although he had a very heavy interest in the Quran and specifically jihad uh, he did a lot of normal things he played soccer followed sports and again there's very conflicting accounts of his academic career and they range all the way from very hard working head down to Uh, lazy, didn't care about much. So we have no idea. So where did he become the bin Laden that we know? You know, when did the radical Osama come around? Well, that's a bit difficult to pin down. He was born and raised in Saudi Arabia, as I said before. Uh, His father uh, ran 
uh, a company that's still around today, by the way, very successful international conglomerate. In fact, Osama's brothers are still involved in the company. Uh, this business vehicle allowed them to be the richest non-royal family in Saudi Arabia. And in 2009, Forbes estimated their combined wealth at roughly $7 billion. So this is still a big, powerful company, even today. Uh, and when I hear all this, my mind does not go anywhere near you know, terrorist mastermind, uh, one of the most infamous people of the 21st century. Um, but a little more digging starts to get the seeds that eventually germinated into the man behind 9-11. So when we think of rich Saudi families, we think of yachts, cars, excess. Uh, but Bin Laden's father was not that way. Uncharacteristically, his father was a simple, uh, devout man, and he worked very hard to instill these values in his children. And while his father fathered more than 50 kids, many of them turned in different directions, ranging from you know, Osama, the guy we're talking about now, being a religious, you know, violent extremist, uh, but a lot of his siblings just became secular Westerners, you know, the, living in the United States and Western Europe, uh, the very people that he vowed to destroy. So it's a bit unclear when his, when his views became extreme, uh, whether it was a single event or a sort of a slow move. But by the 1980s, he was getting very involved in the Mujahideen. And if you don't know who the Mujahideen are, uh, that was kind of the, the big fighting force to fight the Soviets uh, when the Soviet Union had invaded and engaged in uh, what some people call the Soviet Union's Vietnam uh, in Afghanistan. So in an effort to fight the Soviet Union, uh, you know, he did this by setting up a company to help funnel arms and other war essentials into the fight. And between 1979 and 1989, under the name Operation Cyclone, that's a fun one to Wikipedia and read about and go down that rabbit hole. But this is basically a program uh, where the United States, as well as the Saudi Arabian government, funneled about $40 billion over 10 years through the Pakistani ISI. And when you're thinking of Pakistani ISI, think of, they do some different stuff, but kind of think of them as like the Ameri like Pakistan's version of the CIA or their Mossad, um, something like that. And a lot of that money went directly to the people fighting the, fighting the Soviets, um, but it's confirmed uh, that some of this money actually went through bin Laden's hands. So he had contact and he was getting money for a long time from the United States. Because, uh, of course, the United States is embroiled in the Cold War. This is kind of getting towards the end of it. Things are heating up. And, of course, you know, the United States wants to help people that are fighting the Soviet Union indirectly or directly sometimes, but in this case, um, both. So anyway, past that, around 1984, uh, he took personal part in some large battles with the Soviets and started to kind of earn his cred among the, the sympathetic Arab world. So about by about 1988, he split from some of these groups he was involved in um, in an effort to take a more military role. And this is when Al-Qaeda is really formed. A few years later, he's starting to speak out against the Saudi government. The Saudi government doesn't really like things like that, especially from prominent citizens of theirs. Uh, and they exile him. Uh, you know, he's not a part of the royal family. So, and he's one of 50 children of this man that uh, they had had such a connection with. So they exile him. Uh, and he ends up in Sudan in 1992. But he, con he continues to criticize the Saudi government. So they finally have enough and they convince his family to cut him off from a $7 million a year allowance that he's getting from you know the profits of this business. And this is about 94, 95, and he's starting to be linked to assass assassination attempts of world leaders uh, like Mubarak in Egypt. And he's accused of running terrorist training camps in the deserts of Sudan. And it's believed that this is the time he gets involved in his first kind of attack on the Western world, which is a small hotel bombing, and it kills two people. Unfortunately, you know, in the modern world, a hotel bombing that kills two people is not really international news unless it's someone famous. Um, but the reason this is of note is because it's noted that this is the beginning of Al -Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda idea that it's okay to kill innocent people. The idea was that, you know, it's either, it's okay to kill an infidel, obviously, a non-believer, um, but these attacks are starting to have collateral damage, and some of that collateral damage are devout Muslims. And so they kind of adopt this doctrine that, well, you know, we're fighting this horrible enemy in the West and, you know, all these non-believers, 
And if a believer gets killed, well, that's just their reward for being a believer. Now they get to go to paradise sooner. Um, and the reason this is big is because now kind of all the rules are gone. You know, there's no, there's no holds barred. They can, uh, kind of at will, as long as the goal is to, you know, take down the enemy, innocent people in there can be killed too. Um, and that's a change for them. So, so anyway, the Americans and other nations start pressuring the Sudanese government, uh, to give them up. And by 1996, the Sudanese government, you know, has had enough of this pressure from the international community. And they say, look, Osama, you don't, you don't got to go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, so he heads to Afghanistan. Um, but by this time, he really isn't doing much but being a terrorist. You know, throughout throughout his career, we'll call it to this point, uh, he was still focused on business and infrastructure and the construction and all that. So he's got a lot of assets and things that can be taken away uh, sitting in Sudan, and they start taking those things. Uh, so he's got to liquidate everything he can as fast as he can uh, before it's all seized by the Sudanese government. Um, this obviously is not a great time from his point of view. Uh, some sources, and a lot of these sources are like uh, Northern and Eastern African intelligence sources, say that by the time of this expulsion, uh, it's really left him with no choice but to become a full-time radical. And this probably isn't helped by the fact that there was an assassination attempt on him at this time. And none of this is confirmed. But what Bin Laden believed and what some other people believed at the time was that this was directed and carried out by the Saudi Arabian government and that it was advised and possibly paid for by the American government. So just another you know, notch in the belt uh, for his hatred of you know, the West, the United States, Saudi Arabia, etc., um, so anyway, like I said, the Sudanese Sudanese government seizes a bunch of his stuff and he's forced to liquidate. And needs to say he's not happy at this point. So in 1996, he declares war against the United States. And it's important to note that there are some sources linking him to funding and involvement in several other attacks along this entire timeline. Some of these confirmed, some of these are not. But it feels safe to say he was very likely heavily involved in many terrorist goings on in these years. So in 1998, uh, he co-signs this fatwa. Uh, and uh, please excuse me now as I try to explain what a fatwa is. It's actually a very complicated uh, word or concept in Islam that has different meanings depending on the time period and who's saying it and what they're trying to say. Um, but essentially it means it's an edict for something, at least in this context. It's often used as a legal word in Sharia law. Um, it's also used by men like bin Laden. Uh, for example, uh, a perceived enemy of Islam may have a fatwa put on them, meaning it's okay or even directed um, that this enemy of Islam is murdered. And again, I apologize if this definition does not fully explain the word. I'm only trying to define it in the context of the story. So if you want to email me, contact me, give me a better, you know, kind of short version of this word that you think means something other than what I'm saying, please do that. Totally open to that. So anyway, he signs this fatwa called the World Islamic Front for Jihad Against Jews and Crusaders, which essentially declares the killing of North Americans and their allies is, and I quote, uh, individual duty for every Muslim, unquote. And to quote, liberate the Alaska Mosque, um, this is in Jerusalem, by the way, and the Holy Mosque, this is Mecca, by the way, from their grip, unquote. Um, at the apparent news conference that he announces this at, he also announces that North Americans are, quote, very easy targets, unquote. And, quote, you will see the results in a very short time, unquote. So he's saying what he's going to do at this point. This is in 1998. And by 1998, uh, he's taken part in the very famous U.S. embassy bombings that uh, took place across uh, eastern, northeastern Africa. And it's firmly in the crosshairs of the, of the U.S. around this time. Uh, in 98, U.S. intelligence has learned that the 9-11 type or style of attack is being plotted and the current U.S. president at this time, Bill Clinton, is briefed on this intelligence. Um, there's also a f there's also a foiled attack involving um, targets across the world. But one of the big things is they tried to sink a U.S. Navy vessel. They actually had a skiff uh, filled with 
explosives that they were going to you know, <laughs> ride out uh, and try to blow up the ship with. And so there's a lot, lot more about bin Laden. Uh, somebody could probably do a 12-hour podcast just on his life alone, um, but that's not the aim here. I simply wanted to give you a quick background on the man who is really the face of this entire event. So before we jump into the chronological section, there's just one more guy that we have to discuss, and that is who many people call the true architect of the 9-11 attacks. That man is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And for the rest of this section and podcast, we're going to refer to him as KSM. In most of the literature and reports, uh, that's what he's referred to as. And it's frankly just a lot easier for me to say than Khalid Sheikh Mohammed every time. So from here on out, it's KSM. Um, so KSM was born in Pakistan or Kuwait, uh, depending on the source, in either 1964 or 1965, depending on the source. Um, there's some that claim both. But he's still alive today. Uh, he's being held in Guantanamo Bay, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but like bin Laden, he cut his teeth uh, fighting against the Soviet Union. Uh, but before that, he was educated in the United States, receiving a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from North Carolina A&T. Uh, and just one year later, he's living in Pakistan. He joins the Mujahideen, uh, and he's engaged in fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. Uh, there's no record or any mention anywhere that I could find of himself and bin Laden crossing paths during this time. But uh, anyway, it's 1994, uh, and he's involved in his first plot against the United States. And this is probably a good place to stop and talk about how he came to hate the United States so much. You know, the classic narrative is that it was a support of Israel kind of thing, and that's no doubt a big part of it. I won't go off into the exceptionally complicated and controversial Israel-Palestine situation. There is plenty of content on that elsewhere. Um, the point is that Islamic extremists like KSM here uh, often cite the U.S. foreign policy and their relationship to Israel almost without fail when talking about their animosity towards America. But in a 2009 article, the Washington Post cites U.S. intelligence sources pointing out that his college years kind of helped fuel this fire. And here's the quote, KSM or KSM's limited and negative experience in the United States, which included a brief jail stay because of unpaid bills, almost certainly helped propel him to this path of becoming a terrorist. According to this intelligence summary, quote, he stated that his contact with Americans, while minimal, confirmed his view that the United States was a debauched and racist country, unquote. So anyway, in 1994, he ends up in the Philippines uh, with a guy named Ramzi Youssef, and he plans an attack known as Operation Bojinka. And here's a direct quote on Operation Bojinka from the 9-11 Commission report. Quote, Using airline timetables, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Youssef, and by the way, this guy ends up getting caught, by the way, uh, continue with the quote here, devised a scheme whereby five men could, in a single day, board 12 flights, two each for three of the men, three each for the other two, assemble and deposit their bombs and exit the planes, leaving timers to ignite the bombs up to several days afterward. By the time the bombs exploded, the men would be far and away and far from reasonable suspicion. The math was simple. 12 flights with at least 400 people per flight, somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 deaths. It would be a day of glory for them, calamity for the Americans they supposed would fill the aircraft. Unquote. And again, that's just included to show that even back here in 94, he's got these big grand plans uh, that he's architecting to, to strike at the United States. Uh, that plan also involves flying a Cessna loaded with explosives into the CIA headquarters. Uh, without, without getting too much further into it, they get found out. Uh, his buddy Youssef gets caught and Muhammad gets put on the top 20 most wanted list. So you can do the math. This is 94, 1994, and 9-11 is in 2001. So he's on the run for this whole time but not exactly flying under the radar. This is just a different time. And the full force of every Western intelligence agency 
wasn't being brought to bear to find guys like this. Not yet, at least. You know, today we would think of a guy like this as being caught any minute. It seems incomprehensible that he could be doing the things that we're about to talk about him doing without being picked up at an airport or, you know, arrested by the country he's staying in or whatever. Uh, we, we can't imagine that today, but this is a different time. This is pre-9-11, and pre-9-11 and post-9-11 are two very different times. Uh, so anyway, he's on the run, but he's holding a job with the government of Qatar, uh, who the United States has a decent relationship with, by the way. And while he's doing this, he's also flying all over the world, and he's meeting with other jihadists in South America, Asia, other parts of the Middle East. So anyway, the U.S., finally gets sick of this and asks Qatar to arrest him. Um, by this time, by the way, he's met bin Laden at least once in Sudan. Uh, so anyway, of course, someone in the Qatari government uh, lets him know this is the case and he flees. Uh, and he settles in Afghanistan where bin Laden is also now living. And this is in 1996. And this is the year he forms a working relationship with bin Laden. And by 1997, he is a full-fledged member of Al-Qaeda and he starts working on the propaganda efforts. Uh, around this time, he also starts pitching what would eventually end up as the 9-11 attacks. At first, it's a much bigger, more complicated attack involving both the East and West Coast, you know, talking about flying planes into the U.S. Bank Tower in L.A., a lot of other stuff. But that gets pared down over time, obviously. And by early 1999, bin Laden has approved this plan. It was tweaked and debated to get what we actually ended up with in 2001, but it was in the works this entire time. We'll get to more of this later, but KSM is still being held in Guantanamo Bay as of the recording of this podcast. And there's a ton of debate and controversy over this, mostly because of how much and in what ways he was interrogated by the U.S. government. Um, his case is often cited when debates surrounding waterboarding and torture in general come up. But most of his confessions came under torture or enhanced interrogation, you know, pick your preferred nomenclature for what we're talking about here. But one crime of note is the murder of the American journalist named Daniel Pearl. KSM actually admitted to carrying this murder out himself uh, under torture, albeit, um, but there is a video of it happening and forensic scientists have been able to match some key body features uh, to KSM. On top of this, his lawyers have more or less confirmed this point as well. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I think it helps to put into stark detail the kind of men we're discussing here. This isn't just some ideologue, some zealot waving his hands in a YouTube video and watching the results of what he commands on the internet. This guy is all in. Uh, and to to kind of illustrate that, here's just a little detail on the murder of Daniel Pearl. Uh, so Daniel Pearl's stationed in India, in Mumbai, for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but he starts poking around in Pakistan uh, about the connections between the shoe bomber. And by the way, if you don't know who the shoe bomber is, this was uh, not long after 9-11. A guy made some bombs in his shoes, got on a plane... Uh, the plot did not work out, but it was a very big deal, as you can imagine, not long after this attack to hear of someone doing this. Uh, so, so anyway, Pearl is um, investigating the connection between the shoe bomber and Al Qaeda, and somewhere along the way, along the way, Al Qaeda realizes what he's doing, and he's captured and he's brought to KSM. And again, this is under interrogation. Uh, but we can reasonably infer that it's true based on the evidence we have now, several years removed. And here is KSM's statement on the matter. Quote, I decapitated with my blessed right hand the head of the American Jew Daniel Pearl in the city of Karachi, Pakistan. For those who would like to confirm, there are pictures of me on the internet holding his head. Unquote. And these videos that he mentions are actually what have been used to confirm this is true. But before that, you know, they had Pearl read a message uh, right before KSM slits his throat and decapitates him. Uh, I want to quickly say, by the way, that this video is 
most likely horrific. Having unwittingly watched a similar video to this over a decade way back when I was in high school, uh, I didn't feel the need to watch this one or listen to the audio. But just reading Daniel Pearl's statement is chilling enough. So here we go. Quote, my name is Daniel Pearl. I'm a Jewish American from Encino, California, USA. I come from, on my father's side of the family, Zionists. My father is Jewish. My mother's Jewish. I'm Jewish. My family follows Judaism. We have made numerous family visits to Israel, unquote. Immediately after that, um, Muhammad proceeds to murder him, apparently for being Jewish American and poking around in Al-Qaeda affairs. And again, I include this just to point out the brutality, even at the high ranks of this organization. He's doing the dirtiest of dirty work here and is reportedly proud of it. And I think this is important to know as we move into the day of the attacks themselves, because when I'm reading and researching for this, I keep asking myself, how did they get these guys to do it? Like, how did they have the confidence that every single one of these hijackers would pull the trigger on the day of and wouldn't back out? And I've even considered getting into this, some of the psychological theory on religious zealots. But while wrapping up the research on KSM here, I just decided to look into the Daniel Pearl thing a little bit closer. And it finally clicked for me. It's the culture that sets the tone for this particular radical sect of Islam. KSM and bin Laden knew that their carefully selected crew would pull the trigger because no one would get close enough to them had they themselves not been completely and totally committed to this mindset already. Um, we're talking about a group of the top guys are decapitating American journalists with their bare hands and releasing the evidence onto the internet. So that partly explains why I've spent some time on KSM because it helps to burn into your mind the men that are behind this event. It helped for me at least to answer that nagging question in the back of my mind. And that question asks how someone, a whole group of people could do something like this. Uh, and with that, we dive into the day of the attack itself. We're going to be introduced to the hijackers uh, as well as a lot of the ordinary American people that fell victim to this attack on this day. And I'll warn you now, the name of this podcast is called Detailed Infamy. This is a detailed account. I don't play any actual audio, but I will read some select audio transcripts that were captured that day. And make no mistake, 2,977 people died as a result of these attacks, plus the 19 hijackers. Besides those hijackers, those, the rest of those almost 3,000 people did not want to die. And many of them did everything they could to stay alive and deal with a situation that no normal person can really prepare for. Uh, this story is brutal, and at times the details will make you angry, sad. I mean, any number of emotions. But as I say in the intro, I'm giving you a detailed chronology of these events. And this was an enormous terror event. The details are not always pretty, but some of them actually are, uh, especially when we get to some of the heroes that came out of this day. Um, and we'll cover them as well. All right, let's really get into it now. Um, from here on out, we'll be stating specific times of day and the event that happened while pausing frequently to expand on people or themes. A lot of this comes from the 9-11 Commission Report. I quote from it heavily because it is the quintessential text for the scope of this particular podcast. Not quoting heavily from it for this phase of the story, it'd be like doing a podcast on Jesus and not quoting the Bible. It's just, it's all encompassing. There are a lot of resources put into it. It is the text for what we're doing here. Uh, so with that in mind, I want to read one paragraph from the preface of the 9-11 Commission Report that I believe sets the tone very well for what the rest of the story brings. Quote, We learned about an enemy who is sophisticated, patient, disciplined, and lethal. The enemy rallies broad support in the Arab and Muslim world by demanding redress of 
political grievances, but its hostility toward us and our values is limitless. Its purpose is to rid the world of religious and political pluralism, the plebiscite and equal rights for women. It makes no distinction between military and civilian targets. Collateral damage is not in its lexicon, unquote. Um, agree with this statement or not, it's, it's hard not to keep it in mind as we go through these events. So without further ado, um, the day starts for us at 6 a.m. Muhammad Atta and Abdulaziz Alamari board a flight from Portland International Airport in Portland, Maine to Logan International Airport, which is Boston. Atta's luggage is actually uh, subjected to additional screening and is selected by CAPS, which stands for Computer Assisted Passenger Pre-Screening System. And here's a quote directly from the report on that. Quote, CAPS was created to identify passengers who should be subject to special security measures under security rules in place at the time. The only consequence of Atta's selection by CAPS is that his bags were held off the plane until it was confirmed that he had boarded the aircraft. This did not hinder Atta's plans, unquote. And this really kicks off the day. And a little background on Muhammad Atta, um, who would end up piloting American Airlines Flight 11, which would later plow into the North World Trade Center Tower. Um, he's born and raised in Egypt. And you'll notice the theme here. This guy is well-educated. Uh, he studied architecture in Cairo and later went to study in Hamburg University of Technology in Germany. And if we're looking for when the radicalization happens, we don't know for sure, but this is the time that he becomes involved in what will later be known as the Hamburg cell. This is kind of the nucleus uh, of the guy's a lot of the guys that end up carrying these attacks out. And here he meets other guys at the Al Quds Mosque, uh, which, by the way, was shut down in 2010 by German officials after it was again involved in another European terror plot in 2010. And I mean, involved insofar as it was uh, a meeting place uh, for those involved in not only the 9 11 attack, but the later unhatched plots in Europe. Uh, so anyway, Ada gets involved with a few people at this mosque, uh, some of whom, whom go on to participate in the attacks with him, including a guy named Marwan al uh who ends up pi also piloting one of the planes. And shortly after, uh, Ata starts traveling to different places in the Middle East and eventually meets bin Laden in person, uh, as well as KSM, and is subsequently recruited for the 9-11 operation, which they called the, the planes operation. And from here on out, he kind of serves as the lieutenant for this operation on the ground. And later that year, which is uh, 2000, by the way, he and El Shahi end up in an accelerated pilot program in Florida run by a company called Huffman Aviation. He gets the pilot training and then starts moving the pieces in place. This includes final planning, uh, taking several flights to sort of case the operation, and it's also of note that he is the oldest of the hijackers and only 33 years old. And also worth mentioning that uh, only one member of each of these hijacking teams is actually trained to fly. The rest are just muscle. And as we'll find out later, all of the hijackers, including the pilots, you know, sit in first class and plan out how they're going to take over these planes. So each one's got the one pilot and then the four um, the four guys that are just there for muscle, which was needed. Uh, so the other guy that's with Ada is uh, Alamari, who we mentioned earlier, is a Saudi Arabian who had actually been an imam, even though he was only 22 years old, as well as a security guard at a Saudi Arabian airport. Um, and he plays the role of muscle on his flight with Ada, American Airlines number 11. So that was 6 a.m. We fast forward to 6.45. Atta and Alamari uh, land in Boston, and things are starting to move along here now. So about seven minutes later, they get a call from the guy we just mentioned, Marwan al um, who's actually at the same airport in a different terminal. Uh, he is uh, apparently confirming that things are a go, as he's the pilot for United Flight 175, which would eventually strike the South Tower. Al Shahi is from the United Arab Emirates. As we mentioned before, he meets Ada and the others while going to college. Uh, and a quick quote from the 9 11 Commission report 
Um, well, he and Otto were meeting several times a week to discuss their hatred of the U.S. and make all these vague plans for the attack. Um, someone is reported of asking why they never, why he, El Shahi, never smiles. And this is his response: "Quote, how can you laugh when people are dying in Palestine?" Unquote. Um, that's just a glimpse into how deadly serious these guys were, even years before they embarked on this. Um, and a quick aside that I noticed while researching this, you know, we see KSM, we see Bin Laden, uh, and they have this certain look to them, you know, the Middle Eastern clothing, the, lar the large, long beards, um, you know, sitting on the floor, all that. There's a, there's a certain image that's conjured when we think of these guys. Um, but the pictures of a lot of these hijackers, uh, they don't look like that. You know, most of them either mug shots or, or you know, some picture taken for a badge at a college or a job they had or what have you. Um, and these are regular Western looking guys. You know, the picture you often see of Al Shahi, he looks like a million, you know, engineers, accountants, managers, you know, executives, whatever uh, that you see all over the world. You know, he has glasses, he has a plaid dress shirt on. It's just, you know, seeing the faces in these photos makes the gravity of what they were and what they did even harder to conceptualize. Uh, so anyway, back to the timeline. Uh, also at 645, the other three American Airlines Flight 11 hijackers get to the airport. Their names are Walid al Shari, Wael al Shari, and Satam al Sakami. And around this time, uh, the man acting as the muscle for uh, Marwan al Shahi's uh, United Flight 175 show up as well. Now, I'll warn you, is where things start to not make a lot of sense to those of you listening who have done any flying in the last almost 20 years. Uh, what we seem to forget is that the TSA and the blue shirts and the huge security production, these are all born out of 9-11. Uh, security in 2001 at airports is taken a lot less seriously than it is now. In fact, the security back then was not even run by a government agency. It's run by the airlines themselves and often... In every case, I think on this day, uh, is subcontracted to a security company, and so the three we just introduced are selected by CAPS as well. That's the that's the computer program we talked about early on uh, with ATA, and this again only affects their checked bags and they clear the checkpoint. And a couple of them are actually completely uncomfortable with the ins and outs of travel. They actually got some trouble from a ticket agent who had to ask them standard security questions several times and get several answers before she was satisfied. Uh, nonetheless, they move on. So now we move down to Washington, D.C. We're at 7.15 a.m. Uh, we're at Washington Dulles International Airport. And Khalid al Midar and Majin Moked are checking in for their flight, American Airlines number 77. Uh, not long after, the other three hijackers join them. And their names are Hani Hanjor, and then there's two brothers here, uh, Nawaf al-Hazami and Salam al-Hazami. Um, and this next part really, it makes me cringe. I imagine it's going to make you cringe. Uh, a few of these guys are selected by CAPS as well. And I'll read the next part straight from the report. Quote, Hani Hanjar, Khalid al-Madar, and Maji Moked were flagged by CAPS. The Hazmi brothers were also selected for extra scrutiny by the airline's customer service representative at the check-in counter. He did so because one of the brothers did not have a photo identification, nor could he understand English, and because the agent found both of the passengers to be suspicious. The only consequence of their selection was that their checked bags were held off the plane until it was confirmed that they had boarded the aircraft. All five hijackers passed through the main terminal's West Security Screening Checkpoint. United Airlines, which was a responsible air carrier, had contracted out the work to Argonbright Security. The checkpoint featured closed-circuit television and recorded all passengers, including the hijackers, as they were screened. At 7.18 a.m., Madar and Moked entered the security checkpoint. Madar and Moked placed their carry-on bags on the belt of an x-ray machine and proceeded through the first metal detector. Both set off the alarm and they were directed to the second metal detector. Midar did not trigger the alarm and was permitted through the checkpoint. After McKed set it off, a screener wanted him and he passed the inspection. Unquote. It's important to remember here, these guys all had knives 
and or box cutters on them during this entire process. Now, it's easy for us to be upset about this, especially when you read this again from the report. Quote, we asked a screening expert to review the videotape of the hand wanding, and he found the quality of the screener's work to have been marginal at best. The screener should have resolved what set off the alarm. And in the case of both McKed and Hamzi, it was clear that he did not. <clears throat> but again, you know, this is pre-9-11. This is a contract security person. This, these were maybe the millionth people they had wanted without finding anything. And so moving on, they get through a net and almost get caught. And it may have stopped at least one plane from hitting the World Trade Center. Um, you could imagine things would have unfolded a little differently had these men been stopped right here at the airport. Uh, and if you really want to have your heart torn out from your chest, as a quick aside, there's a YouTube video, which is a training video for the TSA, where they overlay voicemails from people calling their loved ones from the planes when they know they're going down. And they overlay this with videos of the planes hitting the towers. And I'll tell you, it makes you have a little more patience the next time your bags get pulled out and inspected. At least it does for me. Um, so moving on, between 7.03 and 7.39, Saeed El Gamdi, Ahmad El Nami, Ahmad El Hanzawi, and Zayad Jara check in for United Flight 93 at the Newark International Airport. United Flight 93 may ring a few more bells in your head than some of these other ones I'm named off, and uh, it should. We'll get more into that later, but this is the flight that eventually goes down in a field in Pennsylvania after what a lot of experts, including the report, call the battle for Flight 93. So anyway, as now he is selected by CAPS, his bag is screened for explosives, explosives, but it passes, as do all of them, without issue. And so with that, the, the pieces are in place, and all that's really left to do is get the planes going and shove off. At 7.35, Atta and Alamari are boarded onto American Airlines Flight 11. Five minutes later, the other three hijackers board the plane. 7.45, Flight 11 is pushed back from Gate B-32 at Logan International Airport. 7.50, this is five minutes after that. Hani Hanjar and his four fellow hijackers board American Airlines Flight 77. Eight minutes after that, 7.58 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 is pushed back from gate C-19 at Logan International Airport. One minute later, 7.59 a.m., Flight 11, a Boeing 767, 81 passengers, 11 crew members, departs just 15 minutes late from Logan International Airport. Um, it's destined for LAX. Uh, loaded for bear to go all the way across the country. Two minutes later, 8.01 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93 is pushed back from gate A-17 at Newark International Airport. Eight minutes later, Flight 77 is pushed back from gate D-26 at Dulles International Airport. And now the wheels are truly in motion. And this is where I'm going to read to you what is, to me, the most bone-chilling excerpt of the entire commission report. Quote, The 19 men were aboard four transcontinental flights. They were planning to hijack these planes and turn them into large guided missiles loaded with up to 11,400 gallons of jet fuel. By 8 a.m. on the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 2001, they had defeated all the security layers that America's civil aviation security system then had in place to prevent a hijacking, unquote. And with that, we're going to wrap up part one of three. Um, in part two, we're really going to be diving deep into the initial moments, the day, and getting towards the end of the day um, of September 11, 2001. I uh, want to thank you for listening, and we will see you in part two.